welcome back everyone um, to the already the last session of this two-day workshop. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome the first speaker of the session, uh, Johannes Knolle from Technical, Technical University of Munich, as well as the Imperial College London. And this talk will um, you know, nicely be linked to the first talk of this conference, uh, a workshop, uh, right? So yesterday morning, we had uh, Rosa Valenti talk about what happens when we stack graphene on top of uh, alpha ruthenium chloride. And so Johannes will tell us more about that. Johannes, welcome. Yes, um, thank you very much um, for um, yeah, the introduction, but also thank you uh, very much to um, Hugh and all the other organizers of this uh, really nice, uh, very focused two-day conference, which um, I have uh, enjoyed a lot. And I especially thought the format to pick a concrete topic uh, with much focus um, was very, very nice. Uh, um, so today, yes, I will talk about anomalous quantum oscillations in these ruthenium trichloride graphene heterostructures. structures. So um, yes, I was lucky that uh, Rosé already yesterday introduced a lot of the concepts. Um, but nevertheless, let me start um, with the broader motivation for this work. Um, and this is really um, um, given by, you know, that we want to understand and see these um, exotic magnetic states, which are called uh, quantum spin liquids. Okay, so let me just very briefly remind you that these have been conjectured um, to exist and appear in what's called frustrated magnets since many, many decades. Um, and um, it's basically that instead of long range magnetism, um, we would get a state um, that doesn't break any rotational or translation symmetries. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it's a, it's a state um, of strongly interacting spins. And in the last few years, we have understood how to characterize that in a positive uh, fashion as a state which is long range entangled um, and also shows um, topological order. So the uh, particular <clears throat> phenomena that are most interesting for us today are that these topologically ordered systems, um, they also come with very unusual excitations. And these are these fractional um, excitations. So here the cartoon picture, for example, for such a spin liquid ground state would be an RVB wave function. So you take, for example, here two spin one half nearest neighbors, put them into a singlet, and then um, an equal weight superposition of all possible singlet dimer coverings would give you such a spin liquid. So then also you can understand the fractional excitations in this cartoon picture. So here an excitation in these uh, magnetic insulators. So um, these are mod insulators would be spin one, for example, spin flip excitations. So that would be breaking one of those singlets. And then here, the special thing is now that um, this spin one excitation is now can now separate into two independent spin one half excitations without charge. And they are deconfined, so you can think of these individually. And they might have, you know, exotic statistics as well um, that, for example, then had been conjectured to be useful in the long run. But, you know, for this talk, basically, the basic observation is that for many years, people have been looking for these uh, systems, but because you don't have any long range order and moreover, these fractionalized excitations basically also mean that you have a quantum number mismatch between experimental probes, for example, probing spin flip excitations, and then these spin flips decay into um, these fractionalized excitations, for example, here in two uh, spin one half um, or spin ons carrying spin one half. That means basically you have only broad excitations, for example, in neutron scattering and actually seeing these states and the ensuing excitations, you know, is something which is highly non-trivial. So then um, the other point is that these states are really strongly interacting. So also from a theoretical perspective, you know, we are, are in higher dimensions, strongly interacting. So we are mostly um, restricted to numerics, which suffer, you know, finite size effects, for example, or, you know, uncontrolled approximations, like, you know, we refer to large end theories or mean field theories and so on. So this is why, you know, the uh, work of uh, Alexei Kitaev um, is also remarkable in, in many respects, but um, precisely in <clears throat> the, from the viewpoint of uh, spin liquids, it's remarkable because he predicted this exactly soluble Hamiltonian. And the other thing is that this exactly soluble Hamiltonian is, you know, remarkably simple. And it's just an easing model where the easing quantization changes um, along the three inequivalent bond direction here in different colors. So you've seen that um, I'm sure many times, so let me be very brief, but let me just remind you that the exact solu solubil uh, solubility really hinges on the fact that for each plaquette, 
you have these plaquette operators, and these are constants of motion, so they have eigenvalues plus and minus one, and they all commute for each plaquette with the Hamiltonian, so you can already block diagonalize the Hamiltonian in these set of what's called flux operators. And then let me also remind you about how the exact solution goes in one slide, because I need that later on, that <clears throat> you can represent spins of the algebra of these in terms of four Majorana fermions, so one without a flavor, for example, and three with a flavor for the different spin direction, uh, yeah, spin components. And then just taking the easing model of the previous slide, you can revive um, uh, it uh, with this representation. And here I've already combined um, the two nearest neighbor um, Majorana fermions with a bond label in this link, into this link variable. And now the magic is that this link variable has also eigenvalues plus and minus one, it commutes with this Hamiltonian, and um, the product of these link variables around the plaquette is directly um, the flux operator WP. So in the ground state, you can just put all these to plus one, there are no fluxes, and then uh, you just have a free Majorana hopping problem of the, on the honeycomb lattice. And um, then for isotropic couplings, you, for example, get the positive energy branch of the graphene spectrum with Dirac um, um, fermion excitations. And from that, you can also understand the whole phase diagram. Good. So then, you know, you all know that the whole field really took off uh, beyond uh, a theorist playground when it was realized uh, in 2009 that certain um, system with strong spin orbit interaction, so mod insulators, but in the strong spin orbit coupling limit, might actually be des described by a leading Kitaev interaction plus some residual um, interactions of the more conventional type. And, you know, there are many, many materials, and, you know, I don't have time to review that, but just uh, um, let me remind you that the one that I will focus on today is alpha retaining track borate. And um, you also see that, uh, you know, there are now um, several review articles on the recent developments available, including our own from two years ago. Um, but um, um, the, one of the main things that I want to stress here is also, despite the fact that we have now many promising candid, uh, candidate materials, the honest truth is also that at very low temperature, all of these do order into a long-range magnetically ordered state, and they're not true spin liquids. Nevertheless, if you look at elevated frequencies and temperatures, it is such that um, you um, see already signatures um, of the, uh, the spin liquid, which is somehow believed to be nearby or proximate in the phase diagram. Okay, and so this working hypothesis has been very successful in explaining, um, you know, a lot of data. But of course, what you really want to do is you want to find a tuning parameter to push the system uh, into um, a true spin liquid state. And there are many ways um, to do that. People have tried out you know, different ways. And here, let me just mention the most popular one. And then, you know, the main part of this talk is actually about these hetero structures, um, you know, also as the idea of tuning the system. So first, here's, um, you know, a plot of the Miel transition temperature as a function of in-plane fields. And you see that it goes to zero, um, you know, just before a Tesla. And moreover, the neutron response is such that um, the, you get a very broad scattering also just when you have suppressed the magnetism. And then the idea was that there is, might be actually a field induced spin liquid separating the trivial high field polarized phase. And, you know, one experiment, um, which you've sure you've also seen that brought a lot of excitement is, of course, this, um, kind of, um, observation of a half integer quantized thermal hole effect that would be directly related, um, to a field induced spin liquid. And in particular, one thing um, that I want to remind you is that when Kitaev invented the Kitaev model, he was particularly interested in this uh, system when you break time reversal symmetry, for example, switching on a magnetic field. And then um, in perturbation theory, you can actually describe this, again, in a soluble limit by an effective free spin interaction that just induces next nearest neighbor hopping for these uh, Majorana fermions on the honeycomb lattice. And what that means is now that your fermionic degrees of freedom in the flux free sector, now you open the gap for the Dirac spectrum. And what you're left with is basically something for the fermions that is equivalent to a PX plus IPY superconductor. And that, you know, is known that their vortices, vortex excitations are very special because each vortex will now form bound state and bind a Majorana fermion. So for example, if you want to do something like neutron scattering by your broke spin-spin correlations, spin will actually create a spin flip 
and that uh, introduces two nearest neighbor fluxes, each of these binds in Majorana. So what that means, you get now a bound state, a fermionic bound state that lives in this um, essentially single particle gap that has been opened by um, you know, these terms here. And the question now is whether you can actually see this flux Majorana bound state in some observables. So, you know, if the question is you want to see some of these fractionized excitations, you can never see them isolated um, because they always have to um, be created in pairs. But nevertheless, it turns out that if you, a few years back, we looked at the neutron scattering response, and although everything is very broad in momentum, um, nevertheless, in frequency, you can actually get a sharp response, for example, from this um, flux Majorana bound state in this non abelian spin liquid phase. And one work that we recently finished, which I uh, would like to mention here, is that we were thinking of, you know, is there something, can we do something equivalent that has been so successful in, you know, the area, for example, of topological insulators, where, you know, you can directly probe, for example, the bulk boundary correspondence in real space. And so one idea was, is there something that we can do for charge neutral excitations, like the one that we have here? And for that, we um, propose- Can I ask a quick question about- Richard? Yes, sure, please. Um, so you say it's sharp. Mm -hmm. is, uh, if, we, if the flux has dispersion, is it still a sharp band or is it actually also two particle continuum that is very narrow? Yes, no, I mean, you're right. So if, the, if you're basically beyond the integral limit, so then there will be some, some, some width to this, uh, to, this, um, to this sharp peak, uh, indeed, yes. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, as long as that's still um, well separated uh, mm -hmm. or that the single particle step is there, you, you should still see it. Thank you. So the point is that what we propose here is that if you have, for example, um, a thin layer or a layer of um, um, your favorite cation material and you put it on a metallic substrate, that you want to actually tunnel through this magnetic insulator um, through your tip. And, you know, that tip can be at different positions. And now the point is that you can have inelastic tunneling processes um, and um, these inelastic tunneling processes will be, um, the, you know, the main ones will be of spin flip character, and that allows you to derive the DIDB current, which is now here a convolution of the local dynamical structure factor. And that's the way how you have a local resolution for these um, magnetic excitations. And so, for example, if you are now doing that somewhere far away from the edges, you would directly see that you would, you know, a spin flip would insert this nearest neighbor flux. So that sharp bound state you would directly see in the DIDV current here. Um, and the really nice thing is about this, that you have a spin selectivity. If you somehow would be able to um, have control over the relative spin polarization of the substrate, the metal and the tip, and then you would be able to probe also different spin components. But the other thing that, you know, you see here indicated are these chiral edge modes which are related to the thermal hall effect, of course. And so here, one thing that we worked out is that if you're at the edge, then you would also directly be able to couple to these chiral charge neutral edge modes and would see them in the DIDB current. Good, but I want to come now to the, to the main point, and this is a different tuning parameter in that field, but you know, this idea of substrate engineering, and that brings me to these uh, retained trichloride graphene heterostructures. So again, I can be very brief. Um, uh, thanks to Rosa who introduced that already. So there are these uh, very recent work who have um, realized um, these devices. And, you know, the original idea, um, I guess, was similar to what has been done, for example, in more conventional systems, namely that you want to use the graphene transport um, as a sensor, for example, to picking up here, um, um, you know, the magnetic transition or the magnetic fluctuations. But it turns out that some, something um, much more um, dramatic happens. Um, but let me just give you the summary of um, the work that uh, was presented, namely, um, you know, looking at this really from an up niche uh, level and then also asking what would be the effective model or what would be the effect on the um, effective um, low energy model for the retained track laurea um, by doing the substrate engineering. So the first thing was that because of the lattice mismatch, we had the strain and that increases the Kitaev interaction. And then the second thing is that we had this large um, charge transfer. And um, yes, so there are also recent experiments supporting that. And I will, you know, come back to that picture um, in the following slides a few times. 
Good. The other thing that was also in this uh, original paper here, which is uh, in the group of uh, um, Marco Burkhardt, so that's the Klaus Klein department of the Max Planck in Stuttgart, is also that they measured the longitudinal um, resistivity of the graphene layer, and they saw as a function of magnetic field these quantum oscillations. And in principle, um, it just seems that because of this charge transfer, you have really um, doped the graphene layer. And you can ask the question, but is there anything, um, you know, any signs of the interaction between, you know, our proximate spin liquid of the retained track chloride um, and the graphene? And um, then here you can already see it. They have plotted it as different temperatures. And there you already see that, you know, here for 2 Kelvin, you get the blue curve. But for 8 Kelvin, actually, the amplitude increases. And that is precisely what you get here, that this is the amplitude plotted as a function of T. And there you see that around 8 Kelvin, you actually have a maximum in this amplitude. And that, um, for the people who have worked in quantum oscillation, is something very unusual, um, because normally you would expect something that always basically leads to temperature-induced dephasing that always goes down. And the main question that really I want to address here is, you know, are these anomalous quantum oscillations, in particular this non lifshitz kosovich behavior, somehow related to the spin-liquid correlations? And, you know, on a different level also for theory, is there any way how to describe that, actually? So that's really the, the main question. So here's a recap of quantum oscillations. Um, and, you know, the point is, is something, again, something that uh, is very well known for, you know, almost a century now. And um, the basic point is that we know that if you put electrons in an orbital magnetic field, they do cyclical motion. And then because of these closed electron orbits, you get these quantization conditions. And then from these quantized areas in momentum space, you can directly then use the oscillation frequency to measure properties of the Fermi surface, so Fermi surface area per perpendicular to the magnetic field. So that basically fixes the frequency. Um, but in 1954, Lifshitz and Kosovich, they also, in the Fermi liquid calculation, basically derived this universal temperature dependence, this chi over sinh chi, where chi you know, is proportional to the field but also um, to the um, effective mass. And then um, this now can be used to look at the temperature dependence to extract effective masses. And here, let me just give you a few classic examples. So for example, iron-based superconductors, heavy fermions with large masses, you know, 100 times the electron masses, and even group rates. So in that sense, you see here that this universal LK dependence appears really everywhere. And in that sense, it's really a big triumph of Fermi liquid theory, because from all elementary metals, like copper to heavy fermions to cuprates, they all follow this LK dependence. And in fact, until a few years ago, if you wanted to look for deviations from LK um, temperature dependence, you would hardly find any. However, that has changed in the recent years. And um, the most dramatic example that started also a lot of um, discussions and interest was, uh, of course, these measurements on some hexaboride in the low temperature phase when this is actually an insulator. And then you also get this very weird temperature dependence. So um, let me also say, again, that's still a lot of interest uh, in exotic quantum oscillations. And let me, um, in the following slides, just uh, give you a very brief summary of what people have been done. So we also learned about early on these data, and then we realized that even in simple inverted insulators, band insulators, you can actually can get, if you go beyond semi-classics, you can get quantum oscillations. And that was then subsequently, we predicted that in quantum bar heterostructures, and their first signatures thereof. But for this talk, you know, the question is really, can we get quantum oscillations from fractionalized excitations? And early on uh, in 2006, Alexei Mitchunich, he had picked up some observations from the beginning of the 90s, namely that an orbital magnetic field can couple um, on a um, non-bipartite lattice directly to the spin Hamiltonian. And he showed that from that you can, for example, get quantum oscillations and measure spin on Fermi surfaces. So recently, we wanted to um, generalize this coupling to the orbital magnetic field also to systems with strong spin orbit coupling. And it turns out that even on the bipartite honeycomb lattice, you get this uh, coupling of the orbital magnetic field. So what happens is now that you know, your microscopic Hamiltonian changes as a function of um, field directly. However, it turns out because the enclosed flux hopping via the ligands, the enclosed area is so small that actually the effect is also small, for example, for things like retaining trichloride. And then, of course, motivated by um, some hexaboride, 
there then were also recent effective calculations that you can, you know, that get um, quantum oscillations by coupling um, direct, uh, to the spin on the Fermi surface, for example. So the motivation was really, you know, is there something, you know, of a similar type going on here um, to, to explain this um, non lifshitz kosovich temperature dependence? And to do that, we wanted to make um, some progress, and that means we wanted to have a minimal effective model. And fortunately, um, one of uh, the organizers of this conference, Urban, he had uh, this very nice uh, PhD work about um, um, a Kitai of Kondo model, and there was also similar work by the group of Yom Kim and Achim Roche collaborators. And so the idea is that, you know, for simplicity, let's assume commensurate lattices, that you have, you know, a Kitai of layer and um, an interior layer of electrons hopping on the honeycomb lattice, and, you know, you couple them via a spin-spin quantum interaction, the of strength J. So now, um, the point is you get a very rich phase diagram. They treated, treated that in some Majoran mean field theory. Um, and you see here that as a function of this um, condo coupling, you get, for example, a fractionalized Fermi liquids. But then there are also these phases where effectively the fractionalized Majorana excitations of your Kitaev layer, they hybridize with the electronic excitations. And then you may get like superconductors or these heavy Fermi liquid phases. So unfortunately, the uh, layers, the experiments so far don't show any su uh, superconductivity. So then, you know, the um, effective description of this low temperature phase um, would be in terms of such a heavy Fermi liquid. And again, I want to stress we don't solve these things somehow self-consistently um, or do similar things like this, but we wanted to really make quantitative contact with the ab initio work and the um, experiments. So then in this heavy Fermi liquid phase, um, following um, these works on the previous slide, you can actually see that now your condo coupling acts as an effective hybridization between your um, graphene layer here um, by these operators C um, and then the uh, fermionic excitations of the magnetic layer. And then it turns out that you can now basically fit your up initial band structure and extract the parameters for your um, effective low energy model. And here um, we show basically um, how that is. So the blue is the data that Rosa showed yesterday. And then this uh, simple effective model would be here, the orange one. And you see that uh, because of the lattice mismatch, you of course get lots of other, ones, um, other bands here. But let me also point out that the Fermi energy is right in this correlated D layer where all the interesting correlation physics happens. Good. So then if you want to calculate quantum oscillations, then of course you also should um, think of how the orbital magnetic field couples. So now the nice thing about this effective model is that you can again do a low energy expansion and it's really remarkable that you can actually calculate the lambda levels exactly. So you don't need to do any semi-classical approximation, which, you know, then would in the end always give you standard lipschitz kosovich behavior. The second remarkable thing is that if you now want to calculate quantum oscillations, there is, we follow earlier work here, and the way to do that is that if you are able to solve analytically for the poles of the Green's function, um, given, you know, by um, these levels, then you can indeed do that. And that's uh, the work of um, my master's student, Valentin Lib, who was able to derive really a closed uh, form for these um, quantum oscillations based on um, the lambda levels that are formed by this effective um, Hamiltonian describing this low temperature phase. And the key thing is that we have a standard oscillatory term here. Um, and then a new non lifshitz kosovich temperature dependence. And here now the uh, key parameter is now this condo scale J. And here we plot, I will show you in, in another slide, you know, an explicit form for that. This is temperature versus um, chemical potential deviating from this large shift, um, which we call big W. And you see that if you're right in this correlated layer, you know, where the almost flat band of the retained trichloride sits, as it enters here, then you see actually a characteristic maximum that is directly related to this uh, new low energy scale. And then if you then shift your chemical potential that you're deep in the Dirac band, then of course you recover standard lipschitz kosovich behavior. Good, so that's the terminology of the theory. So then let's uh, try to um, look at the experimental data. And there we basically collaborated um, with a group of uh, Marco Borkhardt. And um, in addition to the samples that were already published, they did new measurements on different samples. You know, they also analyzed the data differently, either by, you know, Fourier transforming 
or by just looking at um, just um, you know discrete magnetic field values. And here, sh let me show you a typical um, result of the experiments. So these are the open circles. And then our theory, well, let me stress again that we fixed our effective parameters of the theory to the ab initio data. And you see that basically this area here, so which is given by our energy shift W from the charge transfer directly sets the oscillation frequency which um, reproduces those of the experiments. Okay, so that works. So that's a good sanity check. Although here, you know, you could have thought that, you know, that you would also get just by having, you know, a largely doped um, graphene sample. So the question is really, what about any signatures, you know, of uh, your low energy degrees of freedom of your magnetic insulator? And let me stress also that, you know, um, via our picture, we would not be able to directly probe really fractionalized quasi particles because in that um, heavy Fermi liquid picture, these would have actually acquired charge by hybridizing uh, with the Dirac electrons. But nevertheless, you know, they, they acquire um, properties of the, of the magnetic insulator. Good. So then here is our non lipschitz kosovich temperature dependence. So it's a bit messy. So this is um, some complicated function, um, which I'm not telling you here, but you can, um, if you're interested, look it up in the um, publication. And this is then our analysis now of three different samples. So sample A is the one that was um, published previously. And then sample B, C, these are new measurements, also different thicknesses. And you see that they always have, so this is the amplitude as a function of temperature. And here, um, then we fit um, our theory by adjusting um, the condor scale J. And so then you, for all of these different ones, you get a condor scale of roughly two milli electron volt out of that. And you see that you can actually reproduce this characteristic maximum for all these different samples. And this is really, um, you know, this non lipschitz kosovich temperature dependence is really a signature that um, you have this interplay of the itinerant direct electrons with these low energy excitations of the magnetic field. And that is really at the heart of getting um, something um, that is um, of this non lipschitz kosovich behavior out of this. Of course, you know, you can now think of what would be um, competing explanations. And um, um, the first and most obvious one is that, you know, this maxima appears at a temperature that is roughly 8 Kelvin that coincides with roughly the bulk um, nail transition temperature of alpha rotanium trichloride. And, you know, the speculation was whether you're just seeing basically a maximum related to a, a magnetic transition here. However, we argue that, you know, that might be actually um, <clears throat> less likely because, of, first of all, nobody has seen any magnetic transitions um, in these um, thin films or single layers even. Um, and moreover, if you think of a simple picture where your um, graphene electrons would actually scatter off the magnetic spin fluctuations, then you would actually think that towards the nail transition, the magnetic fluctuations would have a maximum. They would diverge towards the transition. And that would actually mean that the scattering time is um, has a maximum around TNL, and that would never give you a maximum um, in the amplitude, but actually a minimum. So, um, of course, there are also um, stringent tests for this scenario that we propose here. Um, for example, you know, tuning uh, the coupling um, that would have a characteristic signature. Or also now we have a picture for what the low energy electronic degrees of freedom would do in this heavy fermi liquid phase, which should be accessible via STM. Um, but let me also stress that, you know, we developed this theory with retaining trichloride graphene heterostructures in mind, but it's actually quite general and, you know, other magnetic insulators deposited on graphene, if they interact with each other, um, you know, could be potentially described as similar scenarios. Right, so that's basically all I wanted to tell you. And um, then let me come into the summary. So the first I um, only very briefly flashed this, this recent work on um, using spin polarized STM as a local probe for um, charge neutral excitations. And then the main part was really on, uh, you know, this new microscopic theory that we proposed to explain uh, these quantum oscillation in retinium trichloride graphene layers. Um, so where we analytically could derive a new non lipschitz kosovich behavior, and then we have new measurements um, from um, the Stuttgart group on these um, heterostructures, which um, allow us to basically have a self-consistency check between the up and each works effective low energy model, and then also these new low energy scales that, you know, would then give rise to an interpretation that we see basically remnants of these um, fractionalized excitations. 
And with this, let me thank you very much again here. So this is the reference for this. And let me, you know, there's a, a growing number of collaborators, some long time collaborators on T-type spin liquids. But for this work here, the STM work, which I just briefly mentioned, was done by Johannes Feldmeier, Michael Knapp here from Munich, and my poster, Green Natori. But then, really, the main part of the talk about um, this quantum oscillation, the calculations were carried out by uh, my master's student, Valentin Leib, and then with input from the group of Rosa Valenti and all the experiments, including new measurements that are done in Stuttgart by Marco Borkov and uh, collaborators. And yep, with this, let me thank you, and um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Johannes, for a very nice talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Maybe I can just, uh, I think I, I missed it, actually. How did you solve it? Like, how did you, for example, calculate R? Um, how do we calculate up? Sorry, I need to find yeah, out. Right. Go back. Mm -hmm. Go back to this. Um, so, yes. So the way we calculate R, I mean, I just, I didn't tell you explicitly. So what you basically um, can do, if you are able to calculate the Landau levels exactly, and this is the second condition. So, and you are able to solve explicitly for the poles of the Green's functions, then what you can do is basically um, use um, some form of calculating the um, um, thermodynamic potential, so the um, grand canonical potential here, mm -hmm. um, analytically, and then you can take this derivative and get this. So, um, mm -hmm. so if you are familiar with how to calculate usual quantum oscillation, like um, the lichitz kosovich theory, there is some Poisson summation involved by summing over the lambda levels. So that's similar that you have to do here. Um, but there is a very convenient way for doing that if you, for example, are able to, to have these requirements of getting analytic forms of lambda levels plus the pose of the Green's function. Otherwise, you would have to do numer numerically, and then you wouldn't be able to actually derive mm -hmm. uh, analytic forms for that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I see you, Jeff, you raised your hand. Please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I just had a question about the, the mean field onsots you used. Sure. So this sure. is a like a U1 spin liquid you're putting on the, 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 the KDAV model? Mm, no. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So let me tell you something about... So the nice thing about um, the Kitaev model is that even like in a usual upper cause of slave uh, fermion description, there are ways of describing exactly the load or basically the, the, the ground state flux sector within a mean field theory. So it would be the same Z2 spin liquid that you would get out of that. Now here what we use is actually we use um, following these works by Auburn and also um, Youngbeck, um, we basically use the phase which would be the heavy Fermi liquid phase where effectively um, you know, have a cooperative condo lattice model, a cooperative condo effect, where now these fermionic excitations have hybrid, uh, hybridized with a with a graphene layer. So, um, and then strictly speaking, you know, these systems now our fermionic excitations of the potassium trichloride layer they are also acquire charge by this effective hybridization. And then it's that low temperature and um, effective um, um, system that we describe here. So yeah, sure. But the yeah that. Uh... Sorry, my question was more about um, in your effective Hamiltonian, you don't have any pairing between the Abercrossov fermions, which no. is, is different than what you would have for the mean field solution of the Kadab model. Precisely, right. yes. yes. And so if there was no high condo hybridization and you just had that on sots, that would be a U1 spin liquid. Um, yes, 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 you're right. Yeah. So I guess what I'm wondering is if I'm wondering what in what way the, the Kadab physics is actually coming in here, right? If I had some frustrated honeycomb lattice model, that had a U1 spin liquid ground state, would you see the same physics if you hybridize it and got into this heavy Fermi liquid phase? Um, yes, I think you're totally right that in, in, in that sense, you wouldn't be able, since we basically, via this effective hybridization, destroyed really the you know, topological properties of the spin liquid phase, I think you are right that you, know, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between like an underlying U1 system or like a Z2 type spin liquid. Yes, you're right, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Urban, I saw you had your hand raised, but maybe your answer's question um, is already answered. Your question already answered. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I wanted to uh, basically point to the same thing. 
Uh, so, I mean, what's particular about the guitar model is that you have these highly bond anisotrop uh, inter an anisotropic interactions, um, which might uh, give rise to particular um, effects here. Yes, that's that's a good point, and that's something that I've slightly glossed over, and this is maybe related to... So if you look in the experimental data, that was discussed briefly yesterday by, by Rosa as well, you actually see that the main oscillation frequency has a slight splitting. And so that is supposed to be related to, for example, the spin splitting, which is related to spin orbit coupling. So here, uh, one thing that we haven't put into, so you can now refine the model, which spoils the, the fact that you can calculate, you know, things analytically, um, but you can still calculate things. And then, for example, um, take a bit more seriously this bond anisotropy, this effective spin orbit coupling, and that would give you this splitting. And that, like you say, would be uh, maybe um, something that would be able to distinguish then uh, from like, for example, having a spin rotation or magnetic insulator. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Natalia, I see you have your hand raised, please go ahead. Yeah, just maybe on the same ground. So uh, since, if I understand correctly, so if you are doing still something like mean field calculation, and mm -hmm. in principle, you can also uh, stay in the spin liquid phase, but you can also include this K gamma interaction, which are important for ruthenium chloride, and just repeat this calculation in this extended uh, spin liquid model. Would you expect some significant differences or not really? No, on that level, uh, level here, we would actually not um, expect any differences. And the reason is simply that, um, so we have this huge separation of energy scales, namely, the, the, the Dirac energy scale T is so much larger than, you know, our J condo coupling or our um, Kitaev energy scale. And that means that the cyclotron frequency um, of the graphene layer um, is so much larger, it's really two orders of magnitude larger than the cyclotron frequency of the effective Kitaev layer, that you basically wouldn't be able to resolve any additional low energy features. So, um, so in effect, really, the main thing that you resolve is that somehow these direct electrons at low energies where the Fermi energy, energy sits, they basically hybridize and they talk to the correlated layer. But I don't think that um, here, um, you know, within that description, you would be able to resolve any other low energy scales. And in principle, you know, in a different system, in an ideal world, you might be able to do that. But then, you know, that would be manifest as a single maximum, but then you would have additional structure, for example, in the temperature dependence. Just one more kind of question, but uh, in principle, when you have temperature, you have also flux degrees of freedom. Yes. So basically, yeah. you're looking for temperature dependence. So, and uh, what about flux, the role of the flux degrees of freedom? even in the pure guitar model? Yes, well, of course, in the pure guitar model, in this guitar spin liquid, you should always worry about those. And I think that's one of the puzzles, um, at least from my point, why, you know, the predictions of the pure guitar model work for the thermal hall effect, where there should be lots of fluxes and so on, um, especially at the temperatures. But here, I think that problem doesn't really arise um, because we're anyway um, in this heavy Fermi liquid phase where, um, you know, you can still think of the fermionic excitations, but probably, you know, it's not, um, so fluxes are not, no good excitations anymore. Um, so that, that... Um, but in the Dirac cone would be modified, yes? So once in the presence of the fluxes, it kind of would modify also your electronic degrees of freedom. So basically you are in the... No, I think, I think we are basically, I think, I think what you're basically seeing really is not, you're not seeing the fractionalized excitations directly. You're seeing basically um, the hybridized version of those. And in that hybridization process, the fluxes are no good excitations anymore. So you, I don't think it's a, it's a picture. I see Urban, uh, Urban is uh, nodding. So um, yeah, that approves it. Good. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, Jung back, right, please. Hi, this is Yong Beck. Um, so I have a, a, a very simple question. So uh, when you look at this uh, new function, R of T, the amplitude of quantum oscillation. Yes. So I, I should really look at your paper, but uh, looks like um, you don't have um, dependence on omega sub K. I suppose omega sub K is some energy scale related to condo, sorry, not condo, the Kitaev, Interaction strengths? Yes, yes. 
Um, is it in the gamma or, or, or it's actually dropped out? Yes, no, a very good question. And so here, what we have actually done is um, that there is a small parameter to do that. And that's also the small parameter to do that, um, to do the calculation analytically. And this is the ratio of omega T, which is the cyclotron frequency of the, you know, graphene, um, um, divided by um, omega K, which is the cyclotron frequency of this very, very narrow Dirac cone of this almost flat band that you have here from the, from the retained triangle mm -hmm. right there. And that number is tiny. Um, okay. And so basically what we've done here in that exact direction, we just set it to zero. Uh, and that means you're not seeing any internal structure. That goes back to a previous question. You're not seeing any internal structure um, on that scale in the quantum oscillation. You're really just seeing that you basically have a correlated flat band hybridized with that. And that's basically that hybridization you see. Um, we checked basically that you can do a formal expansion and that um, you know, we get the leading order and then, you know, anything that would come after that, the first order would be tiny correction on that. That's why I said, you know, testing that scenario, I think really one thing one should do is, for example, something like STM, where you can resolve then also these small energy scales. And there, you know, uh, we basically would say that we have a low energy effective model and, you know, one can actually test whether one sees um, that. And there you would be able to resolve, you know, omega K or just without a field, you know, basically the, the key type energy scale. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, Johannes, thanks again. Yep, thank you very much. <clears throat>